Hello and welcome to part two of this video of the Fourier series example where we find Fourier series coefficients of an arbitrary square wave. Uh, you'll recall the square wave had an amplitude of A and a duty cycle of T. It had a period, I'm sorry, a duty cycle of D. It had a period of cap T. You'll notice something interesting that happened when we uh, computed the Fourier series coefficients. It turns out that the period of the waveform, cap T, doesn't show up anymore. Um, that's because we're basically indexing uh, these uh, coefficients by K, and K is uh, basically telling us uh, multiples of the fundamental harmonic. And since T affects the frequency of the fundamental harmonic, um, it turns out that we don't need T in the C sub K formulas because uh, C1 would be the coefficient for the fundamental harmonic. C2 would be uh, the coefficient for the uh, next higher harmonic and so on. So that was sort of an interesting thing. Um, basically, uh, what we'll do in this video is we'll just show plots of the C sub Ks and show how the various components, uh, it turns out that uh, this part here determines the magnitude and the complex exponential determines the phase. We'll show that. And then we'll finish with a discussion of uh, why we have a non-zero phase here. It turns out that there's a useful interpretation there. So um, what I've done is I've created lots and lots of plots. So for a duty cycle of 0.5 and an amplitude of 2, so I've uh, uh, picked these values so that the average uh, value of the signal is 1, as you can see here. This is a plot of C sub k, so this is C0, C1, C2, C3, C4, and so on. This is actually the magnitudes of the C sub k's. So the C sub k's in general are complex, and in this case they are. This is showing us the magnitude, and the next plot I'll show is the phase. And you can see that the magnitude of the C sub k's uh, starts high and then decreases as the k's get larger. Uh, you'll also notice that for every, I guess it would be even k, so this would be except for 0, so for k equals 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on, uh, C sub k has a magnitude of 0. And this is a consequence of the fact that the duty cycle is exactly 0.5. If the duty cycle is anything else, as we'll show in just a minute, this is not actually the case, that every other C sub k is 0. OK, so um, this also gives us some feeling for what the, um, well, actually, we'll, uh, th this gives us some feeling for what a sync function looks like, because the magnitudes of these guys are a sync function, but this actually isn't the best example. We'll see a better example in a minute. Um, if we look at the phase associated with these C sub k's, uh, the phase you'll recall comes from the e to the j pi k d term. And so basically, the phase here really only depends on the duty cycle. So for a duty cycle of 0.5, I have a phase of minus pi, minus pi over 2, 0, pi, and then it repeats over and over again. Okay, And because minus pi is equivalent to pi, I could have also plotted this so that it would have been pi minus pi over 2, 0, pi over 2, pi. Okay, so you can see then that the phase here, it's, it doesn't have zero phase, um, and the phase is basically a function of the, of the uh, duty cycle. So let's look at the case where we have the duty cycle be 0.12, Again, I've chosen the amplitude so that the average value of the signal is 1. So you can see when the duty cycle is 0.12, that um, this now gives me actually a better feel for the shape, uh, at least for the absolute value of the sync function. There's what we call the large center lobe, and then there's these smaller side lobes that just keep going on out here. Um, and the reason that you would uh, see this, if I have a duty cycle of 0.12, um, it turns out that uh, my square wave is starting to um, 
approximates, uh, well, it's starting to approximate very narrow pulses. And so uh, that spreads out the frequency content of the pulse, which is why I get this picture. Okay, if we look at the phase, it looks like this. And again, you see that we go, we start here at zero and go up in fairly small increments until we get up close to pi, then go to minus pi, close to minus pi, and keep going up in fairly small increments. Okay, and again, the rate at which the phase changes is a function of d. And because d here is relatively small, again, d will be between zero and one. Uh, because d is relatively small, I've got this nice linear progression between endpoints here. And finally, let's look at the case where d is large. So when d is 0 0.8, I, I get something that's very large at the center and then uh, gets away very, or uh, drops down very quickly as k gets large, either positive or negative. Um, when I look at the phase, uh, here I have, um, I'm not actually sure what numbers they are. these are. These are multiples of pi, but I can't remember exactly what they are. Uh, but you'll notice that I have um, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Um, because d is large, I actually don't have a nice linear progression in the phase in the sense that um, I'm wrapping around actually quite often. And so you can see that this guy is periodic, but you won't see a nice linear progression in the phase. So there you have it. Those are plots of the magnitude and angle of the, um, of the Fourier series coefficients of the square wave. So one last thing to, to talk about, and this basically brings in the symmetry properties of the Fourier transform. And so I think it's probably useful to talk about it. Is, oops. Let's look at our original waveform. We had something that looked like this. So for a duty cycle of D, it was 1, and then it would go down until we got to T. For a duty cycle of uh, dt, I'm sorry, it wasn't just d, it was dt, it was 1, and so on. So I have something that looks like this. Now, you can see the way this signal is drawn. This is not an even signal. It turns out if this signal is even, then its Fourier series coefficients would be entirely real. Now, we can draw what the even signal would look like by taking uh, this guy and shifting it so that this pulse is centered at zero, okay? And so you can see uh, the guy that I've drawn here in green. This is an even signal. And because it's an even signal, the Fourier series coefficients of the signal in green would actually just be a D sync uh, K pi D, okay? And this is completely real. It has no imaginary component. But um, to go from the signal that I've drawn that's completely real to the signal in red, which is the one that we did, requires a shift of this distance to the right. And that distance to the right turns out to be um, the shift distance would be dt over 2. Okay. And when I shift a time signal in the frequency domain, so uh, this is my time shift in the frequency domain, I multiply it by an e to the j uh, for a Fourier series k 2 pi times um, the time shift dt over 2. And uh, I need to have an omega 0 here. So I think that should be 2 pi. Yeah, this should be 2 pi over t. And so you'll notice that this guy and this guy cancel, this guy and this guy cancel. 
And this is what I actually ended up with for the phase shift. So the phase shift here is the thing, again, the, or the time shift in the time domain, uh, the fact that I take an even signal, or conceptually I could take an even signal and shift it to the right by dt over 2 so that it is the signal that we looked at, that adds this uh, phase term, which looks like this. So if you work only with even signals, uh, which is not always possible, but sometimes, uh, your Fourier series coefficients will always be real. And then as you shift those signals around, that introduces phase shifts in the Fourier series coefficients. So the main point I hope you got from part two of this video was to see what the uh, sync function looked like for different uh, values of d and to get a feeling for the magnitude and phase and the fact that the phase is a consequence of um, I'm transforming an even signal that has been shifted in time. So thanks for watching.